I'm gonna I'm gonna talk about water, but I'm actually gonna give it um, kind of a context first. So I'm passing these grains around, and you have to take ten of them each. Okay? This is Ariya. It's a sauna where you dry grains. And on Wednesday, we buried an 83 year old man, and he was a botanical uh, person, botanist at the in, in Hamad, but he is originally a Finn. And he uh, had a great empathy when it comes to nature. So he decided, I'm going to find and see if these old cultural grains, uh, I can rescue them. So he went to his hometown in Gruen, Finnskogen, and he found this Irie, and they took it apart, and he found 10 grains. And he managed to grow seven of them. And it's called Svedjuru, and that's why we can today grow Svedjuru, and we can actually bake bread, beautiful, beautiful bread, out of these grains. So, because of his empathy, and his insight and passion for nature, we are now able to grow them again. And they were all for more than 100 years, actually. And he died the week before, so it's very special, and I always tell this story. So, this impact. And this is Svedjuru, and I uh, tried to make seven of them grow. The first year it looked like grass, don't panic. Next year they will be two meter high. So put them in the back of your garden. Do it now, okay? <laughs> and the other thing I want to say, because I, I was giving a talk at the communication day, something, and I did some research on constructive journalism, and I found um, this article in The Guardian saying that uh, kids, youngsters, don't read news anymore because they're too negative. And so The Guardian changed their uh, profile, not stopping writing about the bad things or what's going on, but, but also about good things, about optimistic news on how to make a change. Um, but there was, in this article, the editor of Chief made a big impression on me. Because I'm getting quite old, you're the age of my daughter, and it says that people long to feel hopeful again, and young people especially long to feel the hope that previous generations once had. And that, reading that made me feel really uh, both guilty and responsible, and uh, since then I've been on a mission. I'm going to speak about cathedral thinking and empathy in this context, and I'm going to talk about four works that I'm involved in, uh, in um, and end with water. I work with artists, female artists, all of them by accident. One of them is here, I will introduce you to her later. And uh, this site, one of the artists, because I work with the public space and commons, and I um, uh, commissioned this artist to do a work, and she fell in love with this beautiful site. And um, it wasn't actually green, but that said, we started working with the soil there, and she had this perspective on the soil all the time. And today it's been organically grown, this special common, to become this wonderful farm. We didn't know it was going to end up being a farm, and with a bakehouse, and it has these grains that you just had around it, and it focuses on experienced learning, learning by doing, and the mission is that um, kids, we have to make sure our urban kids never lose their connection to nature by physically experiencing it, because that's how you get emotionally connected to nature, and that's how you uh, gain empathy, and you will take different decisions about the future. So that's in the bottom of this artwork. And we have also dinners, common dinners, shared dinners, every Wednesday. So you should go there if, if you haven't been there. Have any of you been there? No? Yeah? It's a wonderful place, huh? It, it's crazy. And now the city also have hired, a, in a fixed position, a city farm manager. So now I can retire from running this space. I'm happy for that after eight years. The other work is about, it's also artwork. It's by Katie Patterson, a Scottish artist. And she commis I commissioned her also to do a pa uh, art in public space in Bjørvika. But she proposed an artwork that will last for 100 years. And 
when an artist say that and you're a responsible person and you're supposed to do risk assessments and these kind of things, that's when you panic. Never do a risk assessment, because if you do, it won't happen. So, but today we're growing a, a forest of uh, by we planted 1,000 trees, and every year for 100 years we're commissioning an author to, to write a new text, a manuscript, that will be kept unpublished and unread until 2114. We have five authors now. Uh, Marit Atwood was the first one to say yes. And uh, these manuscripts will be kept in a special design room, which is almost finished now. So you won't be open before next year, because it's in the public library on the fifth floor. It's organically formed, of course, and it has small um, this, uh, boxes that you, we will put the manuscript in, and we will keep them there for 20, until 2114. And of course, then they will be printed on the trees we are growing. And this is the forest. It's nothing special about it. It's just another forest, but it's getting enormous response all over the world. New York Times, CNN, BBC, and every day, almost, I get a request, a press request about it. And I think that's because it's about, this work is about basic human things that we need and are in need of now. Because it's about rituals, because every year we walk to the forest together with the author in the footsteps of the previous author. <clears throat> and this is Hong Kong, I met her this weekend. She wrote The Vegetarian, if anyone has read that one. And she'll be here the 25th of May. You're very welcome to come and, come and join us. And if you can't make it this year, you have 95 more chances. <laughs> um, and and this, we, we are in the forest, and it's a very simple ceremony. And nothing special to it, but it's extremely emotional and special. And it, um, it gets to you, in a way. Marit Atwood, I choose this picture because I'm a fan of her, of course. And uh, with her and me, and uh, she said it's a hopeful project. It's an act of optimism. It actually believes that there will be human beings in a hundred years. And I think that's. And she said that what the world needs now are new, strong narratives that tells us how the world is changing and how we can change with it. And that's the hope in it. And I'm often asked. So why do you believe in this project? You'll be dead by then. Who, how can you believe, trust anyone to, to take it on and finish it? And of course, the only answer to that is actually trust. I have to trust you guys. You'll live longer than me to fulfill it. But they also, the coming generation also have to trust me, us, that we actually start these kind of projects. And this leads me to cathedral thinking. And Stephen Hawking, he taught me about that, because Future Library, this work, has been put into that context. And he says it's not going to be about um, inheriting money or property in the future. It's going to, um, what's important is to inherit a grand challenge, uh, projects that one generation start and the next one fulfill. That will change your whole perspective, especially when it comes to these climate kids extremely confronting. If we're going to do something, we have to start now, and we can't do it very fast. We have to do a lot of things very fast, but we also have to do things very slowly to change the world. So I'm going to mention two, another work that I've just uh, started myself. I'm not an artist, thank God. Uh, I'm in the construction business, uh, but I'm uh, very much influenced by these two works. So I've actually proposed the work, and I'll share it with you. Because out of this loose-ended soil, soil literacy, and uh, understanding what that is an extremely important common, the soil is a very important common to us, as water is. But this, when I saw the, you know, the governmental district, they're going to build new houses there. But on the ground, there will be a beautiful, hopefully, common underneath this and amongst these houses. And they, for security reasons, nothing can happen there, almost like commercial things, because in the first floor, they can't have uh, ordinary business. So it's going to be quite quiet space, in a way. And I've been in this expert group, feedbacking into that, and I've said, 
It's just that because the garden or the park is the last thing that will be constructed. And I said, I think, honestly, we have to have as a project to make that and grow that fertile soil on site, slowly, slowly, by people sharing compost, coming. It's an extremely democratic way of doing it. It's a very common act to grow that. And I presented it for the municipality because I know them, and they said, the roses are still just piled from in front of the church. So all these roses are still in just a pile. So we could start with that and then grow and, <clears throat> and make the fertile soil. Because that takes time. And I think this is a very cathedral thinking of. Because people have to understand that it's not a quick fix either. It's a very slowly project on uh, the premises of the nature. You got it? Yeah? <laughs> I'm starting saying it out loud now. And then I met this woman. This is another artist, and she's here, <laughs> Elin. We met, we've known each other for many years, but we met recently again, or it's a, a more than a year, actually. And uh, when she told me what she's doing, and what she's, she's doing a PhD uh, uh, at uh, NMU, and uh, about the interface between land and water. It's like, I think it's just a click in my head and I immediately understood that this is so important. And it's because I've been working on the common, on the soil, I understood that that's where we urban people meet the water, it's actually on the shoreline. And to really understand this is so important and what's going on. So we need to understand what's going on underneath the surface. So I come from the construction business, and when you construct things in Oslo or any city by the fjord or by the ocean, we have no focus on what, how we influence this, the life under the surface. There's no way we are focusing on it. And I'm, this is so needed, not only to be worried about the ocean, the big oceans, but that's, that, this is where we are meeting the ocean. This is where we have to understand how everything is connected, as in fertile soil, this symbiosis. And I, I've learned so much from Elin, and uh, this is actually taken uh, outside Oslo, that the curve of the water in the fjord has been, has been a very, very nice development. The curve has really been rising, but it's flattening out. So now we need to focus again on how are we going to make sure that there will be, the organisms will start living there again to come back, because it's clean. It's so clean you can swim. You couldn't do that when I was young, but now you can actually swim there and it's safe, but there's hardly any life. I'm from the inside country, and I, when I first, you know, when I stepped into the uh, salt water when I was younger, I hate to have it between my toes. You know, it feels a little bit like scary, but now when I understand how important this all is, is it's architecture. It's so important for organisms to, to live in the ocean. That's when I understand that I have so much to learn. And uh, this all it is, it's, uh, we have too little of it, but it's so important. And uh, Marit Atlant, Marit Atwood told me in an interview, if you look on the futurelibrary.no, I interviewed her and she said, kill the ocean and you die. The rest are details, you know, <laughs> she said. So, Ellen is here to discuss with you details in what she does afterwards. You can ask her lots of questions. But my concern is then, we are now starting working together on the Blue Common, focusing on how everything is connected under the surface and how we influence it. And I believe we are now starting a design process with SDG. Now, is the, you? Is the GM. <laughs> Never said it in English before. <laughs> and uh, we, are, we will make sure that uh, disciplines from land, construction business, will have to meet disciplines from uh, the ocean, marine biolo biologists and, all, and these kind of professionals. And we will work together, really work together and make sure that we get a new knowledge platform, platform of knowledge about how this interface is. And we will, uh, we will start that quite soon. And then uh, Elin uh, is doing architecture, 
on the surface. She's working with material. How do we make material that will um, that are sustainable that organisms like? They don't like this flat thing here. They might it needs to be a little bit more messy. And also uh, landscape. How to design landscape? And uh, and uh, but my concern from Lucette is actually then to make sure that kids not only jump into the water that they actually swim and learn by experience. That's how I think the world will change. So the dream is now that uh, since the municipality hired the first city farmer, I told them you have to hire the first world ocean gardener. So remember this is said, let's see how long it takes before they do that. So to sum up, I think social literacy, soil literacy, ocean literacy makes us future literates. So it's all connected. That's why I wanted to wrap it up, not only talking about water, but to give it a context. Thank you.